the water bottle rocket project and the unfortunate events that befell this poor man. This project required me to design and then build a water bottle rocket launcher as well as analyse some aspect of its operation. As evident in my week 5 milestone, early on I was pretty set on the PVC rocket launcher, but the design did change as shown in week 5. It went from this setup shown to the handheld setup that we can see here. From left to right, the launcher was made out of a launch tube, which consisted of 15mm PVC pipe, which was roughly 30 centimeters in length. Next was the collar, which consisted of 30mm PVC pipe, which was around 4 centimeters in length. This collar was then attached to two cable ties, which acted as springs, the ends of which were attached further down the bottle. These springs allowed the collar to rest pressing into the cable ties which held the flange of the bottle in place which prevented the bottle from shooting off. When the collar was pulled down this allowed the bottle to eject and release from the launcher. Next an o-ring was placed in between a gap in the PVC pipe. This prevented air from escaping the bottle once the bottle was placed into the launch tube. Next, there was a PVC coupling attached, and then an extra 35mm of PVC pipe and another PVC coupling. This small gap in the PVC couplings allowed for cable tie heads to be placed in. These prevented the cable ties which were attached to the flange of the water bottle rocket from moving by staying rigidly in place inside that small gap between the PVC couplings. Then, more PVC pipe was used, which was attached to a PVC end piece. A small hole was drilled within this end piece to fit a tyre Schrader valve inside. This acted as the air supply connection. The PVC was all glued together using PVC primer and PVC cement used for high pressure pipes, and the air supply connection was held rigidly in place through epoxy. This costed a lot of money. <laughs> As per my week 5 milestone, initially I wanted to measure the temperature of the bottle rocket, as well as how the initial conditions of pressure and volume inside the rocket affected the overall flight data. To measure pressure, I initially planned on attaching a barometer or a pressure sensor to the launcher, however, the makerspace kindly had a bike pump which had a barometer already attached to it. I only realised this after buying a bike pump of my own. To measure the flight data I planned on recording with my camera at 60fps from a distance and then putting this recording into Tracker which can measure the location of the water bottle rocket through the launch. A key aspect I was focused on was how changing the volume inside the bottle would affect its overall flight and apogee. For this, the inside pressure of the rocket will be kept constant at 20psi and only the ratio between volume and air inside the bottle will change. For each volume, I would record 10 flight apogees. After, I would change the volume by a designated amount and record another 10 until a whole data set was taken, which ranged the whole volume of the bottle. This worked wonderfully until flight 10. No. Okay, that's fine. I still got 10 good launches to get data from, which all are under the same initial conditions. But before we get into our final analysis of the 10 flights, let's first discuss how the water bottle rocket actually flies. A key aspect of how the rocket initially flies is its impulse. This is generated through the high amount of pressure inside the air of the rocket, pushing the volume of water out through the nozzle. This generates an impulse as it leaves the launch tube, allowing the rocket to be sent flying into the air. Newton's third law states that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, and as the mass of the water is ejected from the rocket, this in turn produces an equal and opposite reaction, pushing the water up. This is what generates the impulse, the mass of the water being expelled out the nozzle. Initially, as the water bottle is attached to the tube and pressure is being pumped through the nozzle into the water bottle, the pressure increases but volume remains constant. Using the ideal gas law, this can tell us that the temperature inside the rocket also increases. And we can see that. We'll see water vapour and steam and a cloud being generated inside the bottle as you increase pressure. Once released, 
and the mass is expelled, which is done in a very short time span, we can approximate the change in temperature inside the bottle adiabatically. Using the first law of thermodynamics, we expect the temperature inside the bottle to decrease as it expands and water is pushed out. However, this does not occur. In reality, as the air inside the bottle expands, water vapour condenses onto the sides of the bottle and it gets more cloudy. This is due to the release of latent heat as it goes from a gas to a liquid, thus allowing the temperature inside the bottle after your launch to be significantly higher. Each flight was conducted at an initial pressure of 20 psi, plus or minus a half from the visual readout, as well as 650 mils. However, some of this volume was lost before takeoff, as the launcher wasn't perfectly sealed. We can see from just a few of the graphs of the flight's rocket height versus time that each ascent was fairly parabolic in nature. Each graph had a burst in height within the first few milliseconds of the launch, followed by a much slower ascent, with the average apogee occurring 0.64 seconds after launch, and the average apogee being 13.73. Do not ask me what happened in Flight 8. In the first 0.05 seconds of the launch, the rockets on average reached speeds of 40 meters per second, which quickly decreased. Overall, I did not complete as much as I would have hoped. However, I had a sufficient data set to verify and learn the flight dynamics and physics of a water bottle rocket under my set of initial conditions. Thank you for watching.